You're listening to Gullum Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at gullaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gullaminstitute. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Asiratu Nabawiya. In the previous sessions, uh, last couple of sessions actually, we've been talking about um, the fifth year of Nubuwa of prophethood, and some of the major incidents that we've covered so far um, in in the last few sessions are first and foremost we talked in detail. Uh, over a couple of sessions about the migration to Abyssinia, what were, exact, what were exactly the details, when did it occur, why did it occur, who exactly were the folks that migrated from, uh, Mecca, to, uh, from Mecca to Abyssinia, to Habasha, and what were the repercussions, what was the aftermath and the fallout from so many people leaving Mecca and going to Abyssinia, going to Habasha. S- soon thereafter, we talked about the acceptance of Islam by first and foremost Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was a very well-known, well-liked, popular person in Mecca. By all accounts, he was what, what we would consider a celebrity in Mecca. He was a celebrity in Mecca. He was very famous. Uh, but his celebrity wasn't based on you know, something unfortunate like a lot of times it is, uh, it is the case these days. Rather, his celebrity was based off of the fact that first and foremost, he was a son of Abdul Muttalib. Secondly, he was a very brave man. He was a very strong man. And he was known for his bravery and his strength and his courage. And so based on these factors, he was a very influential, popular, famous person in Mecca. And so he accepted Islam. By the more authentic accounts of the seerah, three days after he accepted Islam, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa made dua for the Islam of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted this dua from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And Umar radiallahu anhu accepted Islam. And we talked about Umar radiallahu anhu's conversion to Islam over the last couple of sessions. And again, not just what was the story, what were the details, but we also talked about what were the repercussions of Umar radiallahu anhu accepting Islam. What effect did that have on the culture in Mecca? What effect did that have on the confidence of the Muslims and how that played a major part in changing the scene in Mecca. Now after these incidents had occurred and the Muslims naturally had risen to a little bit more of a prominent position. They were not to be taken so lightly. They were not to be pushed around so easily. And they had risen to some level of prominence and there was a growing acceptance Even if they weren't accepting, the people were not accepting Islam or the message of Islam or even weren't okay with the fact that the Muslims were there in Mecca. There was a growing acceptance of the simple fact that these people are not going anywhere. See, there's a difference. One thing is for people to accept, the, accept Islam and accept the presence of the Muslims there. And, but there's a secondary thing about people coming to terms with the reality that these people are here to stay. This is a force to be reckoned with. This is not a phase. This is not a fad. You know, this isn't like somebody wearing their clo- certain type of clothing. It's here today in the next season, the fall, it's gone already. That's not the case. But this is something permanent. These people mean business, they are serious. And now that the growing number of, not just people who had accepted Islam, but the growing number of reputable, recognizable names and people, um, the growing number of such people accepting Islam, becoming Muslim, also added to this realization within Mecca. And now the word was starting to spill out of Mecca into the other parts of Arabia, that there is a real force in Mecca now. There's something substantial, something real that is going on in Mecca. This isn't again just some temporary thing that's going on in Mecca, but this is something real. 
And so there's another incident that is narrated by Imam al-Bayhaqi rahimahullahu ta'ala in Dala'il al-Nubuwa and other scholars of the seerah have also taken this incident and mentioned it here that now that the Muslims were growing in number again like I talked about reputable people were amongst the ranks of the Muslims they had marched out in public in broad daylight into the middle of the haram and prayed right at the Kaaba and nobody had the courage or the audacity to go and lay a finger on them to even touch them so they had received this type of public untouchable type status and they had prayed there and made a public display of this and the word of that has started to spread out. It's mentioned that around this time in the fifth year of um, Nubuwa, you also have to take into account that another thing that, was, that had also happened was Abyssinia, Habasha, and Najashi, the king that we talked, Negus, we talked about this king in a lot of detail as well, that they, this king was a major Christian figure at that time. He was, one of, he was probably one of the most prominent Christian rulers in the world at that time. And he, was a, and he was a very devout Christian. And one thing I talked about when talking about his biography and the details about him, we mentioned this, that he was also a scholar of the Christian religion. He was a scholar of scripture. So he was, a, he was for all accounts, was an ordained minister, a priest, who was also a Christian ruler and king. He was very devout. Um, and and that, that, that kingdom of Abyssinia, of Al-Habasha, was known as a major Christian stronghold. And uh, if you remember, if you recall or not, but, um, and you can actually go back and listen to if you weren't able to catch those sessions, in some of the earliest, um, some of the early Sira sessions that we had, where we talked about pre-Islamic Arabia, and where the Arabs who were, who were populated in Mecca, where they were originally from, we talked about Yemen. And when talking about Yemen, we talked about how Abyssinia, Habasha, historically this Christian kingdom had actually invaded Yemen in the past. And so there was a presence of Christianity within Yemen that was because of Abyssinia and Eastern Africa. So this was a very, so to summarize, it was a very f famous and very strong and proud Christian stronghold in the world. Habasha was. And the king was a source of pride for Christians all throughout the world. Now, of course, we know, we've talked about it here, we know from the accounts of the seerah, from the words of the Prophet ﷺ, that Najashi, this particular Ashama, this particular Christian king, had actually accepted Islam. But he was keeping his Islam hidden. Nevertheless, the fact that a hundred Muslims had gone and settled in Habasha in a Christian kingdom were presented in the court of the king and the king had not only allowed them to live there and accepted them into his kingdom but he had in fact given them a protected status had issued a royal decree nobody is to even look at these people wrong let alone lay a finger on them they have my protection the protection of the king the king had fixed an allowance and a stipend for them as travelers as immigrants so that they would be taken care of. So this word had also spread. So now you have to understand that especially Christian territories to the north of Arabia, and these were territories that were occupied by Roman, uh, by, by some of the Roman armies, and even those areas that were not actually physically occupied by some of the Roman armies, were not governed by the Ro Roman kingdom, by the Roman empire, they were still influenced by Roman culture. And so the Christian religion had spread to Northern Arabia. Now the Arabs in Northern Arabia, they were putting two and two together. They said, okay, Mecca, which is the center of Arabia, apparently there's a man named Muhammad who claims to be a prophet. He has a couple of hundred followers at this point, and he's a force to be reckoned with. They are going publicly into the Kaaba, into the Haram. They knew what the Haram, the Kaaba was. They are going publicly in broad daylight into the middle of the Kaaba, and they're praying at the Kaaba, at the Haram. So that means they are forced to be reckoned with. Then they're adding the other factor into consider. They're taking something else into consideration. Well, apparently there are a hundred some out of his followers that have gone to the famous proud Christian kingdom of Habasha. They've settled there. Not only have they settled there, but they've been able to leave a, a strong impression on our king, our Christian king. 
He grants them His protection. He grants them an allowance, gives them money, takes care of them, looks after them. So when they put two and two together, they realize that we should go and explore this. We need to look into this. This is not something we can just brush off. Oh, there's some news coming out of Mecca. There's always some type of nonsense going on over there. It's crazy Meccans, they're always up to something. This wasn't that anymore. So he said, we need to look into this. So Imam al-Bayhaqi rahimahullah, Ibn Ishaq rahimahullah, many of the major historians and scholars of the, uh, scholars of the seerah, they mention now that at the fifth year of Nubuwa, the fifth year of prophethood, 20 men came to Mecca. And these 20 men, Ibn Ishaq mentions, not all the historians concur, but Ibn Ishaq mentions that they were from the area of An-Najd. An-Najd which is northern Arabia, the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. So they came from An-Najd. And that 20 men came from there. This was the delegation. They were actually sent by their people. And the people there in An-Najd were Christian. So they were sent from a tribe of Arabs that was actually Christian. And they were sent as a delegation. So this was a Christian delegation from An-Najd, Northern Arabia. They were sent to go and explore who is Muhammad wasallam, What is going on? Because you have to understand now, everybody kind of is realizing that Arabia might be basically up for grabs. Makkah might be up for grabs. Arabia is in play now. So they sent these 20 men, go and explore, go and find out. And they sent their best and their brightest and their most prominent and educated, the leadership. They sent them. So these 20 men arrive, in, arrive there in Makkah. They look for the Prophet ﷺ. They find the Prophet ﷺ at Darul Arqam. They sit with the Prophet ﷺ and have a long conversation with him. And they actually have a list of questions. So after they ask all of their questions um, to the Prophet ﷺ, some of the narrations actually mention that they first went to the Haram, they went to the Kaaba, and they asked about the Prophet ﷺ. They, they were asked, who are you? Who wants to know? And they introduced themselves as a delegation from the Christian tribes of Northern Arabia. And so the leadership of the Quraysh actually received them, showed them a little hospitality, and you know, kind of to also f find out exactly why they're here. And they said, you know, we're just here to figure out who this guy is and what's going on because we hear things from here, we hear things from Habasha. So we just wanna, just wanna see him for ourselves and kind of feel him out. We got some questions for him. So when they found the Prophet ﷺ and they asked them all the questions that they had, who are you, what's going on, do you mean, well, you know, what are your intentions, etc., etc. The Prophet ﷺ answered all of their questions to the point where they were content. Then the Prophet ﷺ said that, you know, I entertained you, I answered all of your questions, I gave you everything you asked for, now can I also talk to you about something? Can I present something to you? And they said, absolutely. I mean, the man is kind, he's polite, he's accommodating, why, why not? The Prophet of Allah wasallam gave basically presented the message of Islam to them. Gave them da'wah. And the narration actually mentions that the Prophet ﷺ recited the book of Allah to them. He recited some Qur'an to them. The narration mentions that da'ahum Rasulullah ﷺ ila Allah azza wa jal. The Prophet ﷺ invited them to Allah. وَتَلَا عَلَيْهِمُ Quran, And he recited the Qur'an upon them. فَلَمَّا سَمِعُوا فَاضَتْ أَعْيُنُهُمْ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ that when they heard the Qur'an, when they heard the Book of Allah, their eyes became welled up with tears. They answered the call, they believed in him, and they attested to the truth of the message. Not only that, and I mentioned that these were some of the most educated people from these from this Christian tribe. So they actually said that, you know, some of our priests and our monks who are specialized within scripture have actually described to us that there would come a prophet, there would come a man with, with, with the proper message, with salvation from God, from Allah. And you seem to be that individual. Everything matches, everything fits. فَلَمَّا قَامُوا مِنْ عِنْدِهِ 
Now, when they left the company of the Prophet ﷺ to basically go back to wherever it was that they came from, Abu Jahl intercepted, Abu Jahl found them, and he had a group of people of Quraysh with him, basically his crew, his posse, his cronies, they were with him. And the news basically had spread that these people didn't just come here and talk to Muhammad ﷺ, but they believed in him, they accepted his message. And Abu Jahl was beside himself, he was furious. He said, we're bleeding out here. We're losing this battle day by day by day. First, more and more of our Makkans, our own people, keep on going over to his side. Then you have famous prominent people like Hamza and Umar anuma who go over to his side. Now he's got a second satellite location, he's got a second camp set up over there in Abyssinia and Habasha. You got outsiders like Abu Dhar who are coming in from outside accepting Islam, accepting his religion. Tufail, a genius of our people, accepts his religion and goes back and apparently he's now preaching to the people of Ados in his own tribe. Like we keep losing every single day we're taking a hit. Now before you know it, 20 prominent leaders from the Christians of Northern Arabia show up here and now they accept Islam? He's like, no way. I just can't tolerate, I can't take this, I can't allow this anymore. So he intercepts them. He cuts them off. And it actually mentions, he says to them, خَيَّبَكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ رَكْبٍ خَيَّبَكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ رَكْبٍ Which is basically, he's, he's cursing them. He's, he's making dua against them. He's making a bad dua for them. And what is he saying to them? He's saying, خَيَّبَكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ رَكْبٍ may you, may you be ruined on this journey of yours. May you, may you have a terrible ride back home. I hope you get a flat tire. Right? And so he makes, he makes dua against them, he's cursing them. And he says, بَعَثَكُمْ مَنْ وَرَاءَكُمْ مِنْ أَهْلِ دِينِكُمْ That the people who are still back at your home, in your tribe, they sent you here. They sent you here. مِنْ أَهْلِ دِينِكُمْ They are the people of your religion, the people of your tribe, and they sent you here. But what did you do? Tartaduna lahum. Tartaduna lahum. He goes, but you apostated from your religion over here. You cheated them. You stabbed them in the back. Fa, and then he said, Fata'tuna hum bi bi rajul. And he goes, and you were supposed to take back to them news of this individual. You were supposed to just go back, research, find out who he is, go back and tell them who this man is. فَلَمْ تَطْمَ إِنَّ مَجَالِسُكُمْ عِنْدَهُ But he says, you are not satisfied to just go sit down and talk to him, ask him a few questions and just get the news and deliver back home. Rather, what did you have to do? حَتَّى فَارَقْتُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَصَدَّقْتُمُوهُ And you apostated from your religion, you left your religion, and you attested to the truth of this man. So your people sent you here to research, to look into things, find out who this man is and go back and tell them who they are. Instead, what do you people do? You go and you sit with him, but that's not enough. You end up leaving your own religion and adopting his religion. What's wrong with you people? And, and then he goes on to say, he says, وَصَدَّقْتُمُهُ بِمَا قَالَ لَكُمْ You accepted everything he had to say. He goes, مَا نَعْلَمُ رَكْبًا أَحْمَقَ مِنْكُمْ I've never seen anyone more stupid than you people. I've never met any group of people, a delegation that is more foolish than you. You are the most unintelligent delegation of all time in the history of delegations. So he's insulting them basically. He's furious. It's Abu Jahl. I mean, he's called Abu Jahl for a reason. So he's getting ignorant with them. Now, when they hear this, they respond to him, and you can see the khayr of these people. You can see when somebody's blessed with... Why did Abu Jahl die as Abu Jahl? Because this is who he was. How, why were these people blessed with iman and Islam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because you see their character. They respond to him, they say, Salamun alaykum. Say, peace out homie. Listen, 
You had a lot to say to us. We don't have anything to say to you except for salamun alaykum. Meaning, they, they meant it. Of course, we know the legislation. We know the legal matters. But this was something that was instructed to us by the Prophet ﷺ later. That we don't give salam to people who are non-Muslim. We don't say salam like assalamu alaykum to them. That's an Islamic greeting from, to be exchanged between Muslims. But at the same time, they meant it more linguistically. They meant it more linguistically. And what that basically means is we mean you no harm. You go about your way, we'll go about our way. We don't mean you any harm, please don't intend any harm towards us. Salamun alaykum. We came here with peaceful intentions. We plan to leave with peaceful, with peaceful intentions. That's it. We mean you no harm. Salamun alaykum. La nujahilukum. We will not behave ignorantly with you. We will not, in fact, nujahilukum at tajahul, mujahala. It actually means to. Uh, reciprocate ignorance with to ignorance. Say, we will not engage in this ignorance with you. We will not engage in this foolishness with you. You've been cursing us. You're stupid people. I hope you get a flat tire on your way home. You're saying all these ignorant things. We're not going to engage you in this ignorance. لا نجاهلكم. لنا أعمالنا ولكم أعمالكم. For us are our deeds. We're accountable for our deeds and you are accountable for your deeds. لا نألو أنفسنا خيرا We cannot, we knowingly, intentionally cannot deprive ourselves of something that is good. We came here with a certain intention, true. We came here to inquire, we came here to do research, we came here to investigate. We found good, we found khair, we found goodness. Of this life and the hereafter, akhirah. We cannot deprive ourselves of something that's good. That goes against human nature. So we've embraced and accepted what is good. And if you want to revile us, you want to hate us, because we embraced what is good, then so be it. If, if accepting that which is good for us, makes us foolish, stupid, ahmaq, then that's fine. Then I guess your description fits. But all we did was embrace what is good. لا نألو أنفسنا خيراً. We cannot refuse ourselves something that is good. So they responded with this. Some of the mufassirun actually mentioned that it was at this moment and at this time that the ayat of Surah Al-Qasas, the ayat of Surah number 28 were revealed upon the Prophet ﷺ. وَلَقَدْ وَصَّلْنَا لَهُمُ الْقَوْلَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after in the previous passage, it talks about people who do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how many times or how the message is delivered to them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ وَصَّلْنَا لَهُمُ الْقَوْلِ That we continue to deliver to them, to give to them. We continue to serve up to them. The word, which is what is meant by the word, the Qur'an, the reminder, the da'wah, the message. We kept giving it to them, kept delivering it to their doorstep. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ Maybe, hopefully, with the hope that possibly, they will heed the message, they will realize, they will wake up. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say in ayah number 52, الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ هُمْ بِهِ يُؤْمِنُونَ That those people who had been given the book before the Prophet ﷺ came, before the, this Qur'an, the word of Allah came down, they were given another book before that. Hum bihi yu'minun. They are the ones who truly do believe in the book. Meaning they truly believe in their book. So Allah is saying that the people who were given the book before the Qur'an, the people that were given a book before the Prophet ﷺ, they truly believed in it. Not superficially, not superficially, but they really truly did believe in the idea of you know, the scripture, they believed in Allah, they believed in the fact that Allah sent messengers and prophets, they believed in the fact that Allah sent down His kalam, His word and His scripture in the past, and He would do it again. They embraced this fact, this reality, and they believed in it. وَإِذَا يُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ And when the Qur'an, the divine scripture is recited upon them, قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِهِ They said, we believe in it. We have believed in it. 
إِنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّنَا Why have we believed in it? Because without a shred of a doubt, this is the ultimate truth and reality. This is an unshakable truth and reality from our Lord and our Master. إِنَّا كُنَّا مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مُسْلِمِينَ We had submitted ourselves to Allah even before this came down. Because we believed in Allah. We believed in the messengers of Allah. We believed in the fact that Allah had revealed a scripture, a book, a kitab. So we had submitted ourselves to Allah from before that. So now, if Allah has sent another messenger, now if Allah has sent down another book and another message, we most willingly and readily embrace it and accept it and believe in it and submit before it. Inna kunna min qablihi muslimin. أُولَٰئِكَ يُؤْتَوْنَ أَجْرَهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنَ By the way, uh, and again, I don't want to get detracted into more so of a tafsir of these ayat, but I want to explain it in the context of, in light of the story that we talked about. But one little subtle reminder, because the objective in even in these tafsir sessions is to take away relevant lessons, things we can implement. What Allah is saying about these people, and about the statement of these people, that we had submitted ourselves to Allah even before this revelation came. So then of course this revelation is going to have a profound impact on us. We have to understand what that says and what that means. We have to understand. You know, uh, I'll tell you one thing. A lot of times, and this is something I've addressed multiple times throughout the sessions. You know, there are certain things which are reality within our deen. The Qur'an is the kalam, is the kitab of Allah. And the Qur'an is the basis and the, the foundation of an Islamic revival within the hearts of individuals and within communities and societies, without a doubt. But at the same time, we also have to understand that the Qur'an also has certain prerequisites. Because a lot of times we become so emotional or superficial in our rhetoric that we overlook certain necessary things. We overlook some of the prerequisites. That a lot of times we talk about how the Qur'an will change people's lives, and the Qur'an does change people's lives. But we also have to take into consideration as a student of the Book of Allah, as a student of the Qur'an, it is our responsibility, each and every single one of us also have to understand that the Qur'an requires that we come to it with certain things. Just like salah, salah is an obligation, it's a fard, it's a conversation with Allah, it's a life-changing experience. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has required us to come to prayer with certain things. Certain physical requirements like wudu. Certain spiritual requirements such as sound mind and sound heart, khushu'a. With a certain amount of awareness and education to benefit from that prayer. We can read the Qur'an all day long, we can do the translation of the Qur'an all day long, we could sit in a tafsir lecture all day long. But if we haven't prepared ourselves to benefit from it, we'll walk away from it being entertained, having tweeted or Facebooked some gems, or at the very most, you know, with a little more extra information, an interesting tidbit, tidbit or fact, that we can, a factoid we can share with someone, but that'll just about be the extent of our benefit that we take away from. A conversation on the Qur'an, a study of the Book of Allah. But what these people said, the Prophet ﷺ recited a few ayat to them. A few ayat to them. These were practitioners of a religion. These were devout Christian folks. And he recited a few ayat to them and they were literally tears streaming from their eyes. Their life had been changed. They're standing up to Abu Jahl. They're going back to their people as Muslims, as, as inviters and as propagators of this, this religion, of Islam, of the Qur'an. How do a few ayat make such a profound impact on them? And I can't speak for anyone else here, but I'll talk about myself. How is it possible for me to read the entire Qur'an multiple times? How is it possible for me to sit in on hours and hours of tafsir lectures? How is it possible for me to spend, you know, prolonged amount of time with the translation of the Qur'an? And it doesn't cause any change, any drastic practical change in my life. And these people's whole world is turned upside down through a few ayat. I have to ask myself that question if that's the case. And the answer is right here in ayah number 53 of surah number 28. That they came to the book of Allah already submitted to Allah. At some level, they had prepared themselves, they had worked on themselves, they had humbled themselves. 
And they had told themselves that this is the speech of Allah. This is guidance from Allah. And I sit here with the readiness, the willingness, the attitude, the intention of sami'na wa ata'na. Sami'na wa ata'na. I'm here to listen and learn and obey. And then it causes a change in people. A drastic change in people. Because if we're not careful about this, if we do not focus on this, if we don't talk about this, and prepare ourselves for this, we're in danger of spawning, we're in danger of creating a culture, even within the more practicing Muslim community, we're in danger of creating a culture, a scene, where people engage in Qur'anic conversations, and I'm doing all of this in quotation marks, we, we, we're, we're in danger of creating a culture where there are these really riveting and fascinating and intellectually stimulating Quranic conversations that are nothing but just everybody kind of feeling better about themselves. Everybody comes there, feels, you know, just feeds a little bit of their own ego. Everybody feels smarter. Everybody feels a little bit more superior. And then we walk away from there without an ounce of difference in our lives. There's a danger of that happening. And so we have to be very careful. The Qur'an, that's why it speaks very clearly. Devout Christians listen to a few ayat, and their life, their world gets turned upside down. Why? Because they say, إِنَّهُ الْآمَنَّا بِهِ We believed in it, because إِنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّنَا This is the undeniable truth from our Lord. And how do we know it's an undeniable truth from our Lord? إِنَّا كُنَّا مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مُسْلِمِينَ Because we had already submitted ourselves to Allah even before we interacted with this Qur'an. We came here ready to learn. We came here ready to change. We came here as an open book, as a blank page. And that was the effect that it had on us. أُولَٰئِكَ يُؤْتَوْنَ أَجْرَهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ بِمَا صَبَرُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those people, they are the ones that يُؤْتَوْنَ أَجْرَهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ بِمَا صَبَرُوا That they will be rewarded twice. They will be rewarded twice because of their patience. The good deeds that they do, and then secondly, the adversity that they will face in doing good deeds, the scrutiny that they will face, because of that they will, go, they will get double the reward. وَيَدْرَؤُونَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ سَيِّئَةَ And they are people who r- turn away bad things with good things. They defeat evil through good. They counter their own sins with good deeds. And generally speaking, they counter evil with good. وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And especially from that which we have provided to them, Allah says, they continue to spend in charity from that which we have provided for them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا اللَّغْوَ So this is a description of these people, who they are, how they believe, why they believe, and what makes it possible for them to believe. And then number two, what do they do once they've believed? How do they live their lives? They not only strive in doing good deeds, but they counter evil with good. That's the philosophy they live by. They counter evil with good. And they continue to spend in charity. They are patient in the practice of their religion. They counter evil with good, and they continue to spend in charity. They spend in the cause of religion. And then finally, when they are, when they are faced with ignorance, when they are faced with foolishness, and they are confronted by ignorant people, Allah says, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا اللَّغْوَ أَعْرَضُوا عَنْهُ When they hear foolish talk, vain talk, useless garbage and babble, trash, when they hear trash, what do they do? أَعْرَضُوا عَنْهُ They just ignore it. They just ignore it. I know this is a very like basic, kind of almost like a silly you know, uh, line of reasoning or logic, or it sounds very basic, very childish, but it actually is very logical. I don't know about anybody else here, but I remember uh, some logic, you know, like a line of reasoning that used to be taught by some of our elders, previous generations, they used to kind of tell us about ignoring foolish talk. They used to tell us that if you're walking by, if you're walking down the street, or you're walking by somebody's house, somebody's backyard, and they have a dog in their backyard and the dog starts to bark at you. And that happens, you know, in neighborhoods. You're just kind of walking around your neighborhood and the dog starts to bark. 
So when the dog starts to bark at you, do you stop and start barking back at the dog? Okay, no, at the very least, you at least stop and start, you know, just having a conversation with the dog. Like, dog, why do you bark at me? Why, 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 why does thou bark at me? Right? You, you don't do that. And our elders used to tell us, you don't do that, then why do you answer back an ignorant person? Why do you yell back at a fool? Somebody curses you out, why do you stand there and you list off another lo long list of curse words to that person? You're no better now. You're acting just as unintelligently as he was. That's, a, that's, a, that's an animal, that's a simple-minded creature, that animal, that dog. When he barks at you, you don't yell back or even talk back to the dog, you know. Poor animal doesn't know it, the creature does what he knows. He barks, that's what he does. So you go about your business, you realize you're above that. So when they hear foolishness, garbage, mindless jibber jabber, they just they just ignore it. They just go about their way. They go about their business. وَقَالُوا And at the most, what do they say? لَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ We will be rewarded for our deeds and you'll be rewarded for your deeds. سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ We mean you no harm. Peace. You go about your business, we'll go about our business. We mean you no harm. لَا نَبْتَغِ الْجَاهِلِينَ we do not seek out ignorant people. We do not pick fights with ignorant people. Especially if you're walking by a dog and that dog is sleeping, you do not go with a stick and poke that dog. You definitely don't do that. We don't go looking for ignorant people to pick fights with them. So the Qur'an actually, the scholars mentioned that these ayat were revealed about these people. And the Qur'an talked about these people. And the philosophy and the strategy of these people. So now, these people respond to Abu Jahl by saying this, these ayat are revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ reveals these ayat, and you know, at the same time, it's, it's, it's a bashara for those people, those 20 men who accepted Islam. It, it confirms their faith and congratulates them on not just their iman, but even their, the, ih, the, 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 the ihsan that they have lived and they have practiced. And these people go back to these people, uh, go back to their own people, again as representatives of Islam, and as propagators and da'is of the religion of Islam. And now, Abu Jahl and the leadership of Mecca is just completely just losing their mind. They've completely lost it. They are beyond agitated. They are beyond angry. They've just had enough. This is it. Because now it's bad enough that they were dealing you know, with losses in Mecca, but now people are coming from other places. Even practitioners of other religions and faiths are coming here and beginning to accept Islam. 20 people. 20 people from the leadership of a whole area, a major tribe. That's a major hit. So now Abu Jahl is like, what do we do about this? This is, we can't tolerate this anymore. We have to do something drastic. We have to do something extreme. And remember, this is somebody who had tortured people. This is somebody who had killed people. This is somebody who tried to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. Think about what his definition of an extreme is. And so now he's saying, we need to do something very extreme. And inshallah, in the next following session, we'll talk about some of those extreme steps that Abu Jahl decided to take. And our next few sessions will basically lead us into the very, another very famous landmark um, period from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, from the Meccan era of prophethood. And that was the years of boycott and isolation and being socially cut off. And we'll basically, our next few sessions will lead us into that, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. Uh, I, I will, before I forget, one last thing I wanted to talk about, kind of I mentioned it, I alluded to alluded to it a little bit earlier, but I want to reiterate it here at the end as kind of a takeaway message. Again, reflect on the character of people. Reflect on the character of people. Abu Jahl is a foul-mouthed, angry belligerent, disrespectful person who's not blessed with iman or any type of khair. These are well-spoken, polite individuals. There's a certain amount of khair they exhibit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them with iman. 
Good things lead to good things. So we also have to understand, Alhamdulillah, we all have Islam, we all have a basic level of Iman, and we thank Allah for that. But if we intend to grow in that khair, we intend, we intend and we want and we desire to grow in our Islam, in our Iman, in our Ihsan, in our khair, the more we exhibit khair, the more it leads to more khair. And the very least thing that we can do is good character, good conduct. Good character, good conduct. The way we speak, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we manage our relationships with people, says a lot about our iman, a lot about our Islam, and a lot about our ihsan. So that's something at the very least we can focus on and we can inshallah start working towards. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.